announcement uh, as always uh, i hope you've noticed that homework 2 is available on uh, canvas um, it's due next thursday so you have about a uh, little more than a week uh, the theory part of it explores linear models and the idea of feature expansion and uh, asks you to prove a couple of things with uh, some uh, mistake bound models and in theory uh, technically speaking at the end of the last lecture, we covered all that was necessary for the theory part of the homework. Um, today, we'll be covering perceptron and its variants, so you'll have everything you need for the entirety of the homework. Um, as always, start soon. Discuss not on Canvas, but uh, this is an old habit that I'll keep writing Canvas. Uh, just assume that it's a typo. Um, and uh, let us use uh, Piazza. There's a lot of uh, discussion on Piazza, keep it up and uh, uh, keep it going. Uh, there will be an announcement about the project sometime tomorrow. Uh, where, uh, you know, I'm not going to repeat everything I said last week, uh, but they, watch out for an announcement about uh, the project sometime tomorrow. Any questions about the homework? Yes. I am hoping that it will get graded by before you submit the next one. Um, but that's just a hope. Uh, practicalities are that there are 144, 144-ish exam homeworks that need to be graded. And uh, I'm hoping it will get graded before the next one's due. And, you know, if there are any, uh, uh, you know, so, sort of formatting type issues that you have with the homework, we'll be a little bit lenient if we don't end up grading uh, uh, homework one by the time. Other questions? Yes. Regarding the midterm, okay. Um, I haven't thought about it yet. Um, the midterm is at the end of this month, right? So I haven't yet uh, thought about whether I'll give you sample questions. I can tell you what I've done in the past. Rather than giving you sample questions, I'll just give you uh, a super set of the kinds of questions that you might encounter with the guarantee that not one of those questions will show up in the midterms. No, similar times. Maybe, but uh, it will be way longer than what you might uh, reasonably be expected to finish in the class. Yeah, that's uh, like I, we, I was just kind of wondering what type of like, Yeah, we, because, uh, at some point I'll put, uh, you know, uh, upload a document that has those examples. There won't be any code. There won't be any code. I, the, the, it's going to be entirely on paper. Okay. Um, it will look like the theory part of your homeworks. Um, there will be no coding questions. It will, it will cover all the theory stuff that we do in class. So that's yeah. The, the, I don't know how to grade coding questions, answers that are written in, on paper. Uh, that just seems evil. So no. Yeah. yeah. Um, for the midterm, no. For the midterm, the, uh, for the see, I have not yet made the midterm. Um, but uh, there is a reasonable chance that it won't be different. Uh, that said, though, you've just given me an idea. So, I don't know. Uh, yes, uh, does it say submit on Canvas? Yeah, the homework available on Canvas, but you need to submit through GradeCo. The course is not available on Gradeco. Okay, uh, we will. Uh, can one person, just one person, post a note on Piazza so that it's a reminder for us to fix it? Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, when is the midterm? Uh, it's the last. Th Thank you, 29th February. It's the last lecture before the spring break. And it will be in class, it's closed book, it will be for the duration of the class. And uh, I can tell you that uh, people have told me that uh, the machine learning midterm is uh, very, very difficult and annoying. Um, I try. Um, okay, other questions? Only one section has been sent to grade scope. Okay, we can fix it off. Uh, we'll fix it offline. Apparently, only the undergrad section maybe has synced to grade scope. So 
most of the people who are unable to uh, find the grade scope thing are grad students. So uh, it's a, uh, we'll think for big thing. But the questions are available on Canvas already, right? You are able to access the questions, I hope. Okay. Okay. Um, any other things to get out of the way? If not, we'll continue where we left off. In the last lecture, we were talking about the mistake bound model for learning. Uh, the mistake bound model is a rather simple protocol in which the learner interacts with data. Uh, it's mistake, or rather, the mistake driven model is a rather simple protocol. It, uh, it, it, it's basically the following steps learning proceeds in rounds. In each round, the learner encounters an example, uh, uses its internal hypothesis to make a prediction, and uh, then it gets feedback. If the feedback, the feedback is in the form of the true label. If the true label is not the predicted label, that counts as a mistake. And uh, the algorithm has the opportunity to update itself. That's the entirety of the algorithm. So really, for any mistake-driven algorithm, uh, to define it, you need to define how to make a prediction and how to make uh, how to perform the correction if there's a mistake. And uh, we looked at this mistake-bound model. The mistake-bound model for learning says a concept class is learnable under the mistake bound model if the number of mistakes made for the worst possible sequence of examples for the most difficult concept in the concept class is still polynomial in the number of features. Uh, and uh, then I showed that uh, this is not a, a, a trivial set that I've described. The set of mistake uh, bound algorithms uh, that contains some examples. In particular, I introduced this algorithm called the halving algorithm. I'm not going to go over the mechanics of it, but uh, the halving algorithm makes, uh, we, we, showed, we, look, we saw this in class last uh, Thursday, the halving algorithm makes order of log of the number of co uh, uh, concepts, number of mistakes. Um, so it, it cannot make more than those many mistakes. And I also said that halving is optimal, which means no other algorithm for a Boolean function, if the true concept class is Boolean, no other algorithm can make fewer mistakes than the halving algorithm. So that gives us a sort of an important tool because if uh, we, we, need, we need to find what's the best possible number of mistakes that any mistake driven algorithm can make on a certain class of Boolean, on a discrete class of functions, we don't have to think too hard. Just apply the having bound. And you, you, you know that it's order of that much. It can be less than that because big O notation is, uh, you know, it, it, you, I hope you understand the big O notation. And uh, the interesting part here is. Uh, if you have a concept class where you can show that the number of mistakes that even the halving algorithm makes is exponential in the dimensionality, then that concept class is unlearnable. Because no other algorithm can do better. Even the halving algorithm makes an exponential number of mistakes. So you can't learn it because in the mistake bound model, the number of mistakes has to be polynomial by definition. Yes, there's a question. Oh, uh, I'm going to ask. For the mistake we were learning, I remember when we make mistake, we do some update. I want to ask, could we also do some update if we do? The definition of the mistake driven algorithm says you make an update only if there's a mistake. If I, I could advise it, I could I should not. I mean, you can, it's just it won't be a mistake driven algorithm. You can invent your own class of R. It's a, the mistake driven algorithm says the num number of mistakes equals the number of updates. And the number of updates is bounded in the same way the number of mistakes is. Yes. Classification and from the perceptron. What is the query that then you want to update? We haven't covered that. We haven't covered perceptron yet, so let's not get there yet. Any other questions about the mistake driven model and having and such things? Okay, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna talk about um. Uh, what it means to you know learn a concept class uh, easily or not so easily, and to do that, I want to use an example that we already saw before, which was a set of all possible conjunctions. So something like uh, this set here. So the set of all we we saw this example. Um, the set of all conjunctions is learnable in the mistake bound model because uh, the number of mistakes that having makes is uh, the number of possible conjunctions is three power n. 
And so the number of mistakes Harvey makes is log of that, which is basically n times a constant. It's order of n. So having makes order of n mistakes, n number of features. And then we, in an earlier lecture, I also pointed out that there's this rather simple algorithm called elimination, which can learn example, which can learn uh, conjunctions, making only uh, the, the, the maximum number of mistakes will be the number of features. So elimination realizes the bound that having provides. But here's a question. Suppose we want to learn uh, a, a conjunction. Suppose we know that nature chooses its true function from the set of all possible conjunctions. And you have a learning algorithm, and that learning algorithm is now going to search through uh, uh, the, the, the some hypothesis space, right? Should the hypothesis space also be the set of all possible conjunctions? This is a this is a rather simple question. I'm looking for a conjunction. Should I search in the set of conjunctions? Seems reasonable to say yes. Okay. What do you mean? How do you mean? I need to find a pen. I'm going to look in the bag of all possible pens. Seems completely reasonable, except not. Except there's this theorem from David Hosler in 1988. He said, if you have a conjunctive concept. If your hypothesis uh, uh, true function is a conjunction, and uh, your learning algorithm explores a set of all possible conjunctions, in addition to finding a conjunction that's consistent with all the data, you want to find the smallest conjunction that's consistent with all the data. What does it mean, the smallest conjunction? It has no extra features than the ones that, is, that are necessary. So there's a proof in this, uh, uh, the, the theorem from David Hawker says, uh, finding the minimum conjunction that's consistent with data is an intractable com com in, from a computational point of view. It's NP half, if that matters to you. So this is a little bit mind bending. Um, my true function is a conjunction. And Hawker comes along and says, yeah, your true function could be a conjunction, but if you search the space of all possible conjunctions and you look for the smallest one that's consistent with the data, you can spend an exponential or you can spend an unreasonable amount of time doing that. So it's not efficient anymore. And it's true for disjunctions also. If you really want to see how this is proved, it's a reduction to the minimum set tower problem. We are not going to go over the proof at all. But the, uh, the bottom line here is learning the conjunctive concept efficiently is computationally intractable, provided if we want to learn the minimum conjunction that's consistent with the data. Elimination works, but it does not learn the minimum conjunction, the smallest conjunction. So this is weird. On the other hand, it opens up an interesting sort of a uh, possibility. Remember, we talked about linear classifiers, and I mentioned that any kind Conjunction can express can there is a linear threshold unit that corresponds to every conjunction. There's a linear classifier that corresponds to every disjunction. Turns out, even though you want to learn a conjunction, it may be more efficient to do it by searching the set of all possible linear classifiers. Let me explain this with a picture. Imagine this is a set of all conjunctions. Let's call that C. And this is a set of all possible linear classifiers. Let's call that L. L also contains a set of all disjunctions and other functions. If you want to search the inner set uh, to find the true concept, let's say the true concept lies here. If you want to search that inner set to find the true concept, it's not efficient. So you make your search space much, much larger, and suddenly it becomes efficient. It's a little bit counterintuitive. And this is one of the many times that uh, uh, in a lot of these sort of optimization type problems, we will see that searching a discrete space is inefficient, but searching a real value space can be efficient. It's really about the fact that we have access to real numbers in that larger set. Questions? If this does not bother you, then you haven't thought about this enough.
It still bothers me. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, I know. I was thinking that uh, I was hoping nobody would catch that. So let's do it. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a, there's a tiny overlap. But then I had already drawn the ellipse by the time I realized that. So, yes. Yeah. So just to confirm, the reason why this even works is because in general, it tends, it seems like still to do an eight space that deals with real numbers is more efficient than yep. three. Yep. Um, in general, a lot of optimization problems become more efficient when you move to the reals um, because you can take advantage of things like calculus, which does not exist in the discrete space, like derivatives. So when you say discrete space, you also include the index of that, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So a classic example there is uh, uh, integer programming versus linear programming. Integer programming is NP hard, NP complete. Linear programming can be done efficiently. Uh, yes. So in the first in this case, it's not always the it's not always the case. This is one of those weird cases. We are increasing the we are making the hypothesis space bigger by going from a discrete space to uh, a continuous space that contains that discrete thing. Yes. So if you map that back again to the discrete space. Good question. Do we need to? All I need is a classifier. A linear threshold unit performs fantastically well as a decision function. Why do I need to go back to the decision in the space? Unless you want to interpret it as a Boolean function. And that becomes not the real answer. So the short version here is uh, in the more expressive hypothesis class, searching for a good hypothesis can, can be, but not guaranteed to be, can be more efficient. And this is a good stepping point for moving out of this sort of toy examples with discrete functions to linear threshold units. Yes. Yes. So to catch that by entire space is real numbers. Yes. How can it be efficient if I'm searching all the way? Because you're not searching, you're you're not searching in the same way that you would search the discrete space. You would use you use the uh, techniques from geometry to kind of uh, basically move the hyperplanes around the space so that it uh, separates the positives and the negatives because that's what a linear classifier. Is. No, we won't do any of that. We'll just, uh, uh, so for instance, I'll give you a simple example here. Um, let's take a Boolean conjunction in two variables. So let's say I have my F is X1 and X2. I can write this as, I can, this point here is, so I can write this as a truth table, first of all. So it is X1, X2. And this is 0, 0, and 1, right? Alternatively, I can say this is x1, and this is x2. And I have just four possible points in this space that are actually valid. And so this is 0, 0, um, 1, 1, 0. No, I messed it up, but it doesn't matter. So they did 1, 1. And this has a label plus, and these are label minuses. And if I can, it turns out it's efficient to search the space of linear classifiers, lines that look like this, that separate out the positives and the negatives, then it is to find uh, search the space of the discrete functions. And really, the, the, the way to kind of in turn understand why this works is to go over the proof of that theorem. Uh, I can point you to it if, uh, if you're interested. So the non-efficiency uh, lies in the fact that we could do the linear optimization efficiency. Yes. And we can, uh, yeah, there are way more lines that give the correct answer than there are conjunctions. This blue line that I've drawn separates the plus and the minuses. So does this line here. And it does not, I mean, as a first approximation, we are okay with either one of them. 
So there's like a lot of possible right answers here. So you might be able to find the right answer. Since I'm drawing lines and uh, hyperplanes, I feel like uh, we are ready to move on to lines and hyperplanes. Um, so that takes us to the end of the theory part of the online learning section. And now we're going to switch topics. Uh, unless there are questions either here or in Zoom. Yeah. Uh, what are you saying? The it can express other functions. So the the linear threshold unit contains conjunctions. It contains disjunctions. It contains other functions. Conjunctions are a subset, a strict subset. Okay. So that takes us. Yes. For now, because we never have access to the true function. We never know the true function. So we can find more functions. Possibly. And then we can impose preferences among those correct functions that satisfy other properties. Yeah. So we're assuming that the true function conjunctions have each one gets discussed. Yes. So if you have a conjunction in slope, so we're definitely going to look all the way to the Yes. Is there any theory to the convenient model we have find it? Is it even in the conjunction part of that idea? We will, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, I'm going to leave that question hanging. The question is, is there any guarantee that the linear classifier we find is inside the conjunction set? I'll leave that question hanging because I want to come back to that when we talk about the uh, theorem associated with perceptron. 